Social and Cultural Studies, where I teach as well, and where our speaker recently graduated from. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Amari Rush, who is an adjunct professor in the Department of Global and Social Cultural Studies. And she has also taught at the Center for Women's and Gender Studies at FIU. I don't know if you're teaching now. Uh, I'm teaching sociology and gender, now it's with GSS. Okay, good. Uh, but she's also taught there before at the Center for Women's Studies. And uh, some of her other courses include sociology of gender, sexuality of individual and society, from what I got uh, in the department's uh, website. She recently earned her PhD uh, in global and social cultural studies, as well as her previously her MA uh, from FIU. And uh, I believe your track was geography? Yes. OK, great. And in addition, she also earned a graduate certificate in Latin American and Caribbean studies <coughs> and women's studies at FIU. Uh, she's an FIU graduate through and through because she also holds a, a BA in international relations with second majors in political science and geography, all from this university. Her research interests uh, focus on political geography, gender studies, and global political economy, as well as on Latin American studies. Born in Havana, Cuba, she grew up in Miami with a, with a, in a tricultural, I would say, Cuban-German-American family. Hopefully she can talk to us about that uh, during the presentation. And we also just realized that we have in common with this being 1.75 generation, not 1.5, because we uh, are somewhere in between the first generation born abroad and the second generation uh, born here. And then there are the people in between who were born in one place or in another, but who grew up here in the United States. She recently, as I said before, completed her doctoral dissertation the topic, uh, on the topic of today's talks, talk, which will come up, I, I guess, in a moment. The uh, full title is An Alternative uh, Narrative of Integration in Germany Through an Ethnographic Exploration of Cuban Immigration. I was happy to belong to her doctoral committee, along with uh, my colleagues, Miguel uh, Mogrenier, uh, who is the chair, and uh, Benjamin Smith and Astrid Carradas. She has already presented several papers uh, in meetings such as the Cuban Research Institute, which recently was held here at FIU, uh, 2018 uh, conference in Heidelberg, Germany, Title Spaces and Flows, Ninth International Conference in Urban and Extra Urban Studies, and earlier at the first Global South International Studies Conference held in 2012 in Metz, France. So you can see there's a lot of uh, work uh, involved in this uh, presentation. So please help me welcome Dr. Adamati Roche. Thank you so much, Dr. Adamati, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, it's an honor to have you here in my lecture. I always say this is not just a research, but this is the story of my life and my heritage. So before we go into Cuban diaspora, I wanted to talk about field work and reflexivity. Because every good research needs a good field work, and you have to be reflexive. It is the building blocks of your research. So my methodology, this is primarily a qualitative study. I really wanted to study integration through the lived experiences of Cubans in Germany. Really study the nuances, the everyday, and the significance. And that's the only way that I could really look at that is through qualitative study. I used ethnography, participant observation, and non-participant observation. I did 25 one-on-one -on -one interviews and three focus groups. So why Berlin, Germany? There's so many wonderful cities in Germany. Why Berlin? Excellent question. So Berlin is a cosmopolitan city. It's filled with a diverse immigrant population, and it has a rich cultural history. Cuba also had a bilateral agreement with the GDR in 1978 to import workers and students. East Berlin was the capital and the largest city of the GDR, so Berlin presented the highest chances of recruiting participants. Also, I had the benefit that my lovely mother, here to the left, she worked and lived in the GDR. She was a translator for the Cuban embassy in the GDR. So I also had a trusted insider and a gatekeeper within the Cuban community in Berlin. So how could I not do my field work in Berlin? So these little red dots you see here, they are all Cuban restaurants and cafes. I trekked the city of Berlin, I visited all of them, but I did not do participant observation in every single one of them. 
Why? Because some of them just had a Cuban name and had absolutely no relation to Cuba. No Cuban employees, no Cuban food, no Cuban menu. Others shut down. But when I did do the participant observation, were in places that were either owned by Cubans or employed by Cubans. For example, Paradero. It's a Cuban restaurant in Berlin, and it's both operated by and employs Cuban immigrants in Germany. Tough field work getting to eat delicious food and doing interviews. <laughs> so recruitment. How did I recruit my participants? Well, I utilized three methods of sampling. Snowball sampling, convenience sampling, and purposive sampling. The snowball sampling, I first would began with two primary notes, which were my primary gatekeepers. And then as the introductions flew, as more connections were made, several other notes were made. For convenience sampling, through my participant observation and my everyday life, sometimes I would stumble upon someone speaking Spanish, and yes, I was that one person who would just randomly come up and say hi. I'm and I'm a tutorial student. Are you Cuban? <laughs> Surprisingly, not many people ran away from me. Some were not Cuban, others were. And don't be discouraged if in the middle field work, you find your perfect participant, oh, this person's Cuban, but no interview materializes. That's gonna happen. You're a stranger randomly coming up to a person. Doesn't matter, it is still data. Now you're able to map out, okay, there's more Cubans in this neighborhood, Wow, there's a lot more Cubans working here. Is this person Cuban? Is this person from somewhere else in Latin America? And it gives you a wider picture. Nothing is nothing. Everything you will find in field work means something, from the most smallest nuances to the biggest phenomenon. And then proposed sampling. I aim to diversify my data to represent the full spectrums of Cubans in Berlin. Of course, having a perfect sample is quite impossible, and also because that wasn't the aim of my research. The aim of my research was to recruit based on national origin, not based on gender, race, sexuality, etc. But I still wanted to diversify. At a certain point in my research, my second gatekeeper, who is older, professional Cuban, was introducing me to most of my participants. So I saw my data being skewed, and that's when I utilized proposed sampling. I started picking specifically different types of demographics to diversify. The sampling criteria was they either had to be Cuban or Cuban-German, that's myself, <laughs> of first and 1.5 for second generation of adult age. First generation means you were not born in Germany, you migrated. 1.5 means you weren't born, but you migrated before adolescence. Uh, there's also 1.75, as Dr. Johnny spoke about, which you were born, you migrated for adolescence, but you also migrated very, very early. For example, I celebrated my third birthday here. And second generation. You were born in Germany, but of migrant parents. So interviews. I did 25 one-on-one -on -one interviews, three focus groups, and I picked the participants from the focus groups of people already interviewed one-on-one. -on -one. I wanted to do this because sometimes through the interview something came up or there's a new interesting topic that came about, but I couldn't really nail what they were trying to say. And I wanted to dig deeper, but the, some interviews already went two, three, four hours, and I couldn't continue taking up this person's time. So I did focus groups, and I wanted these participants to kind of feed off the synergy of one another. Sometimes I'd even have to ask a question because somebody else goes, no, I think what you're getting at from is wrong because this happens and that happens. So focus groups are a wonderful way to continue those interviews in a different, more complex way. So why did I stop at 23 one-on-one -on -one interviews and three focus groups? Well, the data became saturated. What do I mean by that? Well, taking inspiration from grounded theory, nothing overtly new or interesting came about. So I knew that this was at the point to stop. Also, you'll know you'll be on a time constraint and funding constraint, so you don't want to get a hundred samples. You know you're not you're a grad student. At this point, you're probably broke. <laughs> I know I was, and you have a time constraint. You don't want to take ten years to finish your dissertation, especially when nothing really new is coming up. This is why when data becomes saturated, that's kind of a good point to stop what you're doing. Now, most interviews and focus groups are conducted in places like. 
cafes and restaurants, with some conducted at their place of residence. Why did I choose cafes and restaurants? Well, for safety. While I was preparing to do my field work, there were vast amounts of articles and books that taught you how to do field work, methods and methodology, but I found not many talked about your own personal safety as an ethnographer, and this was important to me. Even though I'm familiar with Germany, I'm still a single female ethnographer in a distant foreign place. So, I conducted participant observation interviews in public and semi-public spaces, both to ensure my safety and safety of participants. Because yes, you're jittery and nervous to meet strange people, but these people, you're a stranger to them as well. You know, you want your participants to feel secure and safe and open to talk to you. So there's a, one of my favorite cafes to do field work in. It's called the Berliner um, in Charlottenburg. And in the front is a busy restaurant, but in the back, it's a little library that a lot of scholars, people from the Berlin of University or Humboldt would come do the work. So it's very quiet. You get to have a cafecito and a little treat and speak to your participant in a very semi-public place. I also created safety zones. So when I was in colleagues, he created this idea of safety zones for researchers doing ethnography in violent places. Berlin is not a violent place, <laughs> far from it. But again, I thought it was a beautiful idea, these safety zones. So I created my own safety zones by meeting participants in neighborhoods and restaurants that I was familiar with. So these restaurants and these neighborhoods, I always make sure to introduce myself. I am a tour student in a rush. I'm an American student doing my dissertation field work here. I'm new, just wanted to make myself known. You know, if anything happens, they know I was here, they know what was happening. Um, in fact, I had the flu once and I didn't visit my regular breakfast place and already the people working there were asking my whereabouts, is she okay? <laughs> What's happening? Are you fine? Do you need me to call someone? I'm fine, I just have a terrible flu. <laughs> so if I was not familiar with the place, I made sure to research the area beforehand. And if the place was far away, I had to travel to Potsdam that day, for example, I always let a family member or colleague know where I would be on that specific day. And the interviews they did conduct in someone else's home were with participants I knew or close friends of those participants I knew. I never went into a stranger's home. So being a female, female in the field, I had to engage with my identity, with my gender when I was doing field work. And there's several things I want to talk about. So to ensure my safety, like I said, I did interviews in semi-public or public spaces, and I also really tried to assert and reinforce my position as an academic before my identity as female. A lot of scholars talks about violence against females in the field is a very real thing. So I did certain steps to make sure that I was an academic <coughs> first before I was female. I also utilized, um, well, I did some of the methods I incorporated was I always had a jacket or a pen or something that had my FIU insignia on it. I was a student first, this is my university. I had a jacket, notepad, pencil, and I, if I did not know the participants, I never introduced myself as Anna. I said, hi, I'm Professor Anna Rush, or I'm doctoral student Anna Rush. Only I like to use my name informally once I start establish a rapport with that participant. I also kept my long, long hair, which is, unfortunately or fortunately, <laughs> a performative and a socially constructed feature of femininity, up in a bun or under a winter hat. And Perron talks about using sense of space and intuition. Your intuition is never wrong. That's hard to get when you're a first ethnographer. You're so grateful to your participants. Wow, you're taking the time from your day to speak to me, to help me with my research. But something in the back of your head says, hey, get out of this interview. And you want to know, ignore it, but do not ignore it. Your intuition is never wrong. For example, I heard about Alexander Plotz underneath the World Clock Tower. A lot of single Cuban men you know, come together, do a lot of drinking. And I said, oh, I'm going there. I don't care, I'm not scared of anything. I take Krav Maga every Friday, whatever, I'm okay. 
I got there and I said to myself, nope, this is not happening. It's a lot of drinking, a lot of drunken behavior. I just did not feel safe. So instead of engaging in interviews and participant observation, I engaged in non-participatory observation. I went across the street, ordered a latte, and wrote down everything I could get. But I really want to make clear, and this is very, very important, being female did not interfere or deter in my field work in any way, shape, or form. In fact, on the contrary, it was beneficial. I was viewed as non-threatening. A lot of scholars have talked about this, which provided greater access and rapport with my participants. I also found that older male participants even desexualized me because I reminded them of a daughter or a niece, and I reinforced that thought. Oh yes, oh that beer you're drinking, that's the beer my grandpa drinks. Oh that's funny, that cigar you're smoking, that's my uncle's favorite cigar. Reinforce that desexualization for my participants. And it worked for me. The rapport was established, it was viewed as non-threatening, and they almost had this familiarity to me. As someone from the family, do you need help? Do you need this? Do you need that? So it was beneficial. So the politics of being an insider. So the beginning of anthropology, especially of ethnography, you would go to these faraway exotic places, things that no one knew about, people that no one knew about, to conduct your field work. Being an insider was kind of like, oh, are you sure? It was kind of like a negative thing. You know, you want to be an outsider, you want to immerse yourself in the exoticness of a place. But that's not anthropology anymore. That's not ethnography anymore. You can conduct ethnography in another country, in your own country, in your neighborhood, in your community, even in the digital space. And being an insider is not a negative, it's a positive. It facilitated my entrance and introduction in the field, facilitated my report through familiarity. And let's be honest, it's impossible to be absolutely objective. You know, enlightenment thought, during the enlightenment, we came up with this thing of objective knowledge. You want to be purely objective. But postmodernist thought made us realize it's impossible to be 100% objective. In fact, it's a negative to state that you're completely objective. And it's more helpful to say, hey, there is some subjectivity here. There might be some bias. Because regardless if we're an insider or an outsider, we're not disinterested researchers. Our research means to us in different ways. It has meaning. And when things have meaning, there has to be some sort of insider, outsider, bias, subjectivity going on. The important thing is to be transparent, reflexive, and to acknowledge it. La Rimana. <laughs> My uncle lovingly nicknamed this, which translates to the feminized version of the German. <laughs> so when I first migrated to the United States, that everlasting question, so what are you? I didn't know how to answer that. Cuban? German? I mean, I would say Cuban, but I was this little red-headed, pale, with little, little speckles in my face with a weird last name, Rush. Where does the Rush come from? I had this little German accent when I spoke Spanish, an even greater accent when I spoke English. What are you? I didn't know. I didn't know what I was. And then every time I receive something like a good grade, make the honor roll, even a wrecked early for an appointment, the phrase, porque ella es alemana, ah, because she's German, came up. I performed the stereotype that people had of Germans. In the same way that my Cuban identity was a marker of difference in Germany, I also performed my Cuban identity. So I was never Cuban enough for Cubans or German enough for Germans. In fact, I felt most German in Miami and most Cuban in Germany. So what was I? What am I? American. <laughs> I reconciled both seemingly binary identities through a third identity, through my American identity. I integrated so seamlessly into the American mainstream that I felt comfortable saying, hey, you know what I am? I'm American. Which means that I eat schnitzel, natural hungry, every day. I celebrate Oktoberfest. I dance salsa. And heck, I celebrate Super Bowl Sunday like it was a national holiday. I can be both Cuban-German, not be Cuban, not be German, and still feel 
I'm American. So that's why I consider myself both an insider and an outsider in my research. As an insider, I was able to objectify my opinions, differentiate between the personal and impersonal. And as an outsider, that position acted as a buffer against my bias. Because even though I am Cuban German, I'm an American student. So I'm not intimately related to the politics of being Cuban in Germany. So, Cuban diaspora in Germany. So, Cuban migration to Germany can be divided roughly into two migration waves. The first migration wave is post-Cuban revolution and pre-German reunification roughly early 1960s to mid-1990s. Second migration wave is post-German reunification and mid-1990s until the present. So Cuba's relationship with the GDR. Whenever I, I talk about my research, the first reaction is, wait, there are Cubans in Germany? Yes, yes they are. <laughs> and I focus on the GDR as opposed to the FRG because there wasn't any really significant presence of Cubans in the FRG. Cuba, incredibly, was the only Latin America to recognize the GDR, to legitimize the GDR as its own country during the era of non-recognition, which is before 1972, when no country wanted to touch that. They're like, oh, we're just, oh, no, we're not talking about this. We don't know what GDR is. We don't want to recognize. We just, we don't want to deal with this political situation. Cuba said, yes, you are a country. We will support you. And in the 1960s, began sending Cuban students first, and then Cuban students and workers. In fact, a couple Cuban students even saw the creation of the Berlin Wall in Berlin. There are around 30,000 Cubans that studied and worked in the GDR, and Cuban <coughs> students were sent studying, and highly skilled labor were sent to places like the embassy as high-ranking officials, and then the low-skilled workers, which also includes semi-skilled workers, were usually sent to manufacturing factories outside the city centers. Now, I do these two roughly different categories because Cuban students and high school workers always enjoyed a greater autonomy and greater freedom than the low-skilled workers. They were usually secluded in these factory towns and areas. So after reunification, there's this apocryphal theory that most Cubans defected and stayed in Germany. Research with Perez um, Naranjo and by myself, we realized, hey, the, that's not true. <laughs> Actually, the opposite was true. Many of the Cubans returned to Cuba. However, there was a re-immigration later on from Cubans that returned and then re-immigrated to Germany, which is why the statistics were as they were and why people thought, oh, they just stayed in Cuba. No, they actually re-immigrated. And those that returned to Cuba were more integrated into Germany than they thought. In fact, a lot were stating, oh, I had to reintegrate myself into the Cuban society. As one participant said, after so many years in, in Estranjero, I became an Estranjera in my own home. After so many years in the foreign, I became a foreigner in my own home. And they've established networks and connections with people in Germany that facilitated that re-immigration. The second migration wave. Like I said, it's re-immigration, established networks, and it was also perpetuated by Radio Especial, a moment of such extreme hunger and poverty in Cuba that incited mass immigration out of Cuba. In 2008, there was 8,383 Cubans, and the primary method of migration for the second migration wave is family reunification. There are some political asylum cases and cultural visas and education interchange programs, but they're the exception rather than the rule. Give you a couple seconds. I know some of you are taking notes. That is lovely. <laughs> integration. Why don't I utilize these six measures of integration? 
citizen acquisition, language attainment, labor market, intermarriage, religion and religious identity, which is not a very common measure of integration, but religion and religious in identity in Europe is considered almost a fundamental marker of social divide. So I was interested to see where Cubans fell in this seemingly socially constructed inclusion, exclusion, binary line of belonging. And identity, belonging, or receptivity. Cubans feeling accepted in Germany? Is Germany their home? How are they being received? How are they feeling in Germany? So in Germany, it's not uncommon to hear foreigners of the third generation, which means there are people that are born in Germany, third generation, and yet still haven't gained their German citizenship. They're still considered legally as foreigners, unfortunately. This was not the case with Cubans in Germany. All my participants were documented. 18 had their German citizenship. One had a Spanish citizenship. Two had a residency permit and one had a temporary worker's visa. All except the Spanish citizen declared the intentions to become a German citizen one day. And what it meant to them was two things. First, there's an emotional connection to German citizenship. And second, it was considered a necessity. As one participant put it, with the German Reisepaps, you can go wherever you want. The world's open to you. There was this juxtaposition between the German citizenship and the Cuban citizenship that's sometimes riddled in control and restrictions, whereas the German citizenship represented freedom to them. I can travel the world, I can do what I want. The second, if you do not have papers here in Germany, you have no work, you have no help, you are on your own. It is a necessity. So all my participants, except for five, were either fluent or conversational. These fives that weren't fluent or conversational came from the second migration wave, and language was a widely agreed upon mar marker of integration. Every time I asked, what does integration mean to you? Widely agreed upon, a language, you, you have to know German. In fact, some even stated, it's a fact that I speak if I lived here and I did not know German. It's a lack of respect if I lived here and I didn't know German. However, I found that lack of linguistic integration did not mean overall field integration, which is kind of the meta-narrative we hear over and over. Oh, this person didn't know German, this person didn't know, learn the host uh, language, it means it's a rejection of the host country itself. I didn't find this to be true. In fact, the five participants that didn't know German integrated across all their measures, such as intermarriage or belonging. I had a participant that didn't work, was having trouble finding a job in Germany since he was a German citizen. He didn't know German, but he said, man, I've been here barely a year, and every time I go back to Cuba, one day I'm like, I want to go home to my house, to my home. And it would be shocked even himself. I lived all my life in Cuba. I grew up here, my family's here, and yet Germany's my home. So the labor market. The first migration, they all finished their formal education, either university level or through vocational and technical schools. The participants were in occupations such as in fields of higher education, real estate, finance, literacy, and business entrepreneurship. For example, one participant studying the GDR in the 1980s received his PhD in biology at a German university. And now he's the head of a research unit at a major pharmaceutical company. All were employed, not reported any welfare benefits, which signifies successful labor market integration. In fact, one participant even proudly, a bit smugly stated, huh, I'm doing better than even most Germans. I have a brand new BMW, latest model. More of a variation comes in within the second migration wave. So within this range, the educational background of this group ranges from no education, past basic secondary education in Cuba, to a PhD earned in Germany. The occupations of this group also range from unemployment, part-time employment, temporary work contracts, self-employed and full-time employment. Two participants were one unemployed and one was working part-time. All three received welfare from the state.
So interestingly, I, though it's not a comparative study, in my mind, I always had these little comparisons. That's a Cuban that grew up in Miami versus Cubans in Germany. And I thought, this lack of an ethnic enclave. There is no ethnic enclave in Germany. There is not that ethnic co-community in Germany for Cubans. And I wondered, how does that work with the neighbor market? Well, funny enough, Cubans in Germany thought that being Cuban, there was a pervasiveness of the idea that it was an advantage for two main reasons. The first, ah, Cubans have a favorable perception of, uh, Germans have a favorable perception of Cubans. The phrase, Germans love Cubans, was uttered so many times I could not keep track. <laughs> As one participant said, when I first came to Germany, I went to the employment office, and I began asking how to file paperwork to begin working. When the man at the office found out I was Cuban, he went crazy with excitement and loved the fact that I was Cuban. He began telling me stories about his vacation to Cuba and how much he liked, how much he loved it there. He found me a job at, I had seen at the name of the company to protect the identities of my participants. On my first day of work at blank, major pharmaceutical company, they had flowers, a welcome sign, and one waiting for me at my desk. I felt so welcome. And also, the notion that humans possess inherent qualities that make them successful was also pervasive. It was things like, gana de salir adelante, want to advance. Ingenious, imaginative. You had all these positive attributes to being human that they felt was beneficial, especially for their competition in Germany. For example, when I was first given my unit to run, I wanted to change everything about the way things were. I, watched, I wanted my unit to have an edge that no one else had, but it was hard getting these Germans to approve anything that was even slightly different. Like when I wanted to add a ping pong table to a breakthrough, it took months of back and forth to approve it. Or when I wanted to change the colors of the walls in my office, that took even longer. But that's the edge I bring into the scene and has made me successful because I have a view of things that no one else does. And if they do, they won't dare say it. Meanwhile, I'll scream it out. I'm even successful here because of that. The way we humans are is special. However, beyond the perceived benefits, there are very real disadvantages. There's the lack of social networks that does not facilitate the entrance and navigation of the labor market and social networks are the primary way immigrants enter, social, enter the labor market. Also, establishment with native Germans can be difficult. Unlike Cubans in Spain, Cubans in Puerto Rico, Cubans in Miami, there is no shared language. Unless you speak German, it's very, very hard to communicate with Germans. And communication, cooperation with the native, uh, natives of your country is paramount to successful economic independence and integration. So Cubans are kind of like in this isolated place because there's also no Cuban ethnic community in Germany. There's, you can't rely on your co-ethnics and it's hard to rely on natives when you first immigrate. So they're in this very real disadvantage just within the labor market. Concerning intermarriage, 11 are or were married to Germans Eight of them made their, met their partners in Cuba. Six were married to Cubans, but they migrated as a couple already. Three were divorced, two were never married. One is married to an immigrant from Colombia. And I found there was a proclivity, proclivity towards intermarriage. In fact, so much so that even a participant said, I doubt a Cuban who did not already immigrate married would marry another Cuban in Germany. And there are benefits to intermarriage, right? Well. If you're married, you have an easier time to gain your citizenship, to gain German citizenship. You have to be married for at least two years and be in Germany for at least three. You also have a mediator between you and the native uh, society, right? You have someone introducing you to the German language, establishing networks. You already have pre-established networks. So now you have an easier time into the labor market. And there's also this shared background. Humans in Germany overwhelmingly considered themselves European. So they found themselves to have qualities related to Germans. Regarding religious identity, 
Fourteen reported that they were Catholic slash Christian. Only five said that they formally practiced the religion. Nine said that they considered themselves a Catholic Christian or not practicing. There were only three participants, which was a family unit, that were very active in the church, and they belonged to that evangelical church in Germany. Five were non-denomination, considered themselves just overly spiritual. Four reported that they practiced Santeria, which we know that um, in Cuba, the lines between Catholicism and Santeria are often blurred. However, even when I asked about Santeria, Cubans that practice it said, oh, no, no, no one in Germany cares if I practice Santeria. As a participant put it, Germans don't differentiate Cubans. Even the Santeria, they tolerate it. Some are even fascinated by them. In fact, Varadero, the Cuban restaurant that I spoke about, when you first come in, there's the most beautiful statue of La Caridad del Cobre. She's the patron saint of Cuba, and she has sunflowers and candy, pennies, all given to her. You can deduce maybe it's a sign of Santeria, maybe it's just a Catholic practice, but the Germans loved it. Some walked right by, others took pictures, others donated some flowers, and they were asking. So Santeria wasn't considered a threatening religion, but rather an exotic one. Overall, as the participant put it, the majority of Cubans here are idiosyncratic. Not practicing and very few actually go to church. So even though Germany is a secular state and there's a lot of non-practicing uh, population in Germany, you can argue that this Christian, Judeo mentality paradigm is seeped into the everyday. We see it with things like Christmas markets, kindergartens that still practice religious um, Bibles. There's still a lot of hospitals and uh, especially schools in Bavaria that have the Catholic Christian cross on the door. So you can say even though it's a secular, non-practicing state, it's still ingrained into their everyday, into the paradigm, into that European paradigm identity. So Cubans, they said, eh, I'm not really practicing, but I do consider myself Christian Catholic. I celebrate Easter and Christmas. They didn't feel excluded in any way, shape, or form. They actually felt very included. So when I asked Cuban and German, all the studies participants that were not Cuban German answered Cuban. Well, with a caveat. So every time we said, I'm Cuban, they would immediately follow up with things like, but I'm not the typical Cuban, maybe more German, or I'm a special Cuban, because I'm Cuban, but I feel German. I am Cuban, but I feel like I was born here in Germany, like I spent my whole life here. Or I'm Cuban, but you know what? I'm not what you consider human. I don't drink rum, I don't dance, I don't like to be loud. I'm more of a lone wolf. I'm very punctual, not like humans. In that way, I'm like my German friends, more than my human friends. The only time I don't feel German is with the weather. The gray, the cold, muddy snow, I hate that. So there was this lack of a hyphenated identity. We see here, you're Cuban in the US, and what do you say? I'm Cuban American. You know, this hyphenated identity is so pervasive in American society. But in Germany, there's this lack of, no, Cuban German means you're ethnically Cuban German. I'm Cuban, but I'm more like a German. So even though they inadvertently and indirectly said I'm Cuban German, it was almost this refusal to use the hyphenated term Cuban German. It was more like Cuban with a caveat. However, most participants did describe themselves as European. Three regarded themselves as Latin American, and there were two outlier responses. I consider myself international, and I am from the Caribbean. The participants of this study kind of really identified more as a European than as German. Again, that lack of a happy new identity. But none of my participants used the term Latin European because they didn't really consider themselves Latin. In the way that some uh, Latin Americans in Spain, there's been studies by Berg that show that they do use that Latin European terminology. I didn't find that to be true in Germany for my Cuban participants. So what did it mean to be German to them? You know, what, did it mean? what was their perception? Nearly all the descriptions were positive when they, when they were asked to describe Germans. The most frequently used adjectives were punctual, 
intelligent, respectful. In other descriptions that reference language, tradition, ideology, things like the Christmas market or an Easter right now. In Germany and Easter, they have Easter menus in restaurants. They have the Easter version of the Kinder Oberhraschen eggs, the little chocolate eggs. And only across four interviews were the terms, were negative terms used like cold or reasonable, stuck in no way slash linear thinking slash rigid views. It was overwhelmingly a positive perception. And that perception was mutual. All, the Germans, the Cubans said, oh, Germans love us. You know, we think great of them and they think great of us. So overall, Cubans felt included in a sense of belonging in Germany. Like I said, being Cuban was significantly considered a marker towards inclu inclusion. As my participant said, Germans love Cubans. I have a Cuban flag on my guitar, and everyone always stops to talk to me, and I request that I play Cuban songs, or this kind of fetishization, almost of the exotic nature of Cubanness. German men go crazy trying to find a Cuban wife. You see these men go all the way to Cuba to find one. And Germans think highly of Cubans because we integrate better than any other group, and we're very much like them. You see that perception that, oh, being Cuban is an advantage. You know, our inherent qualities allows us to succeed, to integrate better, this shared Europeanness. You see how it starts functionally in this socially constructed motion into integration. How things like belonging kind of weaves into intermarriage, intermarriage and then weaves into citizenship and then leads into language acquisition. How all these six measures are coming together so are Cubans integrated in Germany? Well, indeed they are. But there's a difference between two of the waves. The first wave, all participants from this migration were naturalized, fluent in German, fully employed, and considered Germany their home. In the second migration wave, there are some variations. Some participants have completely integrated, while others have integrated either socially, economically, and or legally, but not all three. Danke. Gracias. Thank you. That's the end of <laughs> Any questions, concerns, comments? Thank you. Uh, have you noticed uh, in the distribution? 